Welcome back to Mr. Bigowski's English class. Hi guys, welcome back. Uh, we are into the second half of the semester now. Uh, your report cards are into the universities right now and uh, we are on to uh, basically further in the poetry unit. Uh, just to clarify, the marks that went into your midterm mark are based solely on the short story unit. The ministry mandated that we don't put further marks on the report card after March break. So basically that was it. And that's, uh, that's what we ended up with. So just to clarify, even though your marks are into universities and those universities have them by now, if you get in and you end up failing the class, of course you can't go to university. So I know a lot of people got into uh, kind of out of the habit of doing work and into the habit of handing stuff in really late kind of last minute Please don't do that in the second uh, section. I'm making sure not to give you guys too much work uh, You're doing a lot less work than you would be doing if we were in class right now And so make sure that you're keeping up because it's gonna be very easy to fall behind now Let's talk about short stories. I just want to clarify a few things. I've made individual comments on your short stories already so you should have read those and uh, you got feedback on that uh, some of the main things that i saw were uh, you know they're generally uh, pretty good but uh, there were a lot of short stories that kind of relied on the almost entirely narrative just a lot of exposition a lot of explanation uh, a lot of people telling the story rather than showing the story uh, and how do you show the story? Well, you do it with dialogue. You break up all of that kind of exposition and you put in some dialogue and you break up the page a little bit. Uh, you get to know the characters a little bit better through their actions and things like that. So, uh, you know, just keep that in mind in the future when you're writing stories. Kind of break them up a little bit more. Uh, but generally, uh, pretty good stuff. Uh, another thing I noticed, uh, people switching tenses, quite a few people uh, would switch from past to present to past to present and there was no real rhyme or reason behind it. It's fine to switch a tense if uh, a story is happening in the present and a character is talking about something that happened in the past, it is okay to switch to past tense. But if you kind of randomly switch from present tense to past tense in the middle of a story, uh, it's jarring for the reader. So pick a tense and stick with it, okay? Whatever, whichever, whether you're saying it in the present and the, the action is immediate or you're talking as if whatever happened happened in the past, just keep in mind to keep it consistent. And the final thing I noticed was uh, resolutions of stories. Uh, some, I mean, a story is a story, but a well-written story tends to have a point. If a story doesn't really have a point, then you kind of start wondering what the use of putting it out is if it's just a bunch of stuff that happens. So uh, make sure that there is some sort of a story arc in your story, that there is action. The characters have some real stakes in the story. Make sure that the characters uh, are working towards something and either achieve it or don't because that's what a story is. It can't just be a character living their life and a portion of their life without having really any uh, kind of uh, resolution to it. So, we're on to the poetry unit now. Make sure that you're keeping up with the poetry journal. Uh, I know a lot of people fell behind in the short story journal and then had to catch up, so uh, don't make that mistake. So far, we've got two journal entries, and I'll assign you a third one today. So, uh, make sure that uh, you're keeping up with those. That way, you're not scrambling at the end to hand in your journal. So, the first one is your epic introduction of a person, and the second one is your lyric poem. The third one I'm going to introduce in a second because today we are going to talk about poetic meter and the rhythm in language. And that's something a lot of people don't think about too much. Uh, it's something that we encounter and recognize sort of implicitly, but we don't really, we can't place our finger on what it is that makes language beautiful. We know it when we hear it, but we can't place what it is that we're really hearing. So today we're going to go into the rhythm of language. When you hear a great speaker or maybe a good rapper or a great singer or a great poet and you hear the beautiful rhythm in their language, it sort of just flows and it, it sounds so good. We're going to break down why language sounds that way. So down below I'm including a PDF of a uh, handout that I would have given you in class and it's about the meter of poetry. Give that a read first and then come back and watch the rest of this video. 
okay? Uh, we're gonna break it down uh, as a group here, but I want you guys to read that piece first so that you sort of, even if, you, even if it's not all clear to you right away, as we're going through it, it will become clear, but I just want you to, to uh, have read it before we cover it as a group. All right, so off you go, read it, and I'm going to switch to a screen view in a sec. All right, so here we go. I'm assuming you read this handout already. If you haven't, go back, read it first, and then we're gonna go over it as a group. So meter in poetry is a pattern or rhythm in the language. It's something that you don't maybe consciously pick up, but subconsciously you're picking up that a person is speaking with beautiful rhythm. One example of this is Shakespeare. Shakespeare used to do this in his poems. Shakespeare, of course, was a poet in addition to being a playwright and wrote many uh, poems. Most of them, I think all of them, as far as I know, were sonnets. And sonnets were very rigidly structured poems. They had 14 lines. They had a very rigidly structured rhyme scheme, A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, and then G, G was the uh, structure of the rhymes in a Shakespeare sonnet. We're going to take a look at one uh, in a second. Uh, but in addition to that, what you don't notice is that every line is the same length and every line has the same rhythm. So what do I mean by that? Let's take a look at the sonnet entitled, Shall I Compare Thee to a Summer's Day? And I'm just going to look at the first line, but I assure you, every line follows this rhythm. So when you look at the line, Shall I Compare Thee to a Summer's Day, thee is you, you can see that it's got not only does the whole poem rhyme, but you can see that this line has 10 syllables. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Basically, what's happening here is that the syllables are arranged into pairs, and each pair of syllables is arranged into a unstressed and a stressed syllable. So this is the first pair. Uh, this is uh, shall I. Compare is the second pair. The two is a third pair. A uh, sum is the fourth pair. Mer's day is the fifth pair. Now, what is a stressed and an unstressed syllable? Language has a rhythm. There's a certain way we pronounce things. So we, we pronounce the word compare with a stress on the pair. We don't put the stress on the com, because if we put the stress on the first part of that word, it would sound like compare, but we don't say it that way. We say compare. So in each case, and with each of these stressed pairs, we place the rhythm or the, the, the stress on the second syllable. And so it comes out nice and sing-songy. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? And it's, it's got a nice rhythm to it. Now, each pair of syllables is actually called a foot. The syllables are broken down into five feet. Because there are ten syllables and each foot is two syllables, that breaks the whole line down to uh, five feet. Now, a line with five feet is called a pentameter line. Pen as in pentagon. That means five sides. Well, five feet uh, is pentameter. So in this case, you can see, shall I compare the two a summer's day, uh, our uh, five uh, syllable feet there. And each one of these metric feet is called an ion. An iam is a metric foot where the first syllable is unstressed and the second syllable is stressed. There are different types of feet. For example, a trochee is the opposite. In a trochee, the uh, first syllable would be stressed and the second syllable would be unstressed. We'll take a look at a trochee in a little bit. So you can see there's a lot more to this poem than meets the eye. To us, to, to the average person, you can see that there's some rhyming there. You can see that it's a pretty little poem. Uh, the poem is written in what's called iambic pentameter. The feet are iams, unstressed, stressed, and there are five of them, which means that it is written in pentameter. If there were four, for example, you'd be looking at tetrameter. So now let's take a look at different types of feet. An iam is probably the most popular one, unstressed, stressed. A trochee is the opposite, stressed, unstressed. A spondy are two stressed syllables. An anapest is unstressed, unstressed, stressed. Dactyl, stressed, unstressed, unstressed. And pyrrhic, unstressed, unstressed. Okay, 
Now below are the different kinds of lines depending on how many feet they have. Monometer is one foot, mono means one. Diameter, two. Trimeter, three. Tetrameter, four. Pentameter, five, and so on and so forth. All right, now let's take a look at some examples of iambic pentameter. Okay, this is probably the most commonly used poetic foot in the English language. So let's take a look at from On His Blindness by John Milton. When I consider how my life is spent, ere half my days in this dark world and wide, you can see that there's a real rhythm there because the second half of the foot is stressed. Now, uh, if you are writing and you are writing a word like consider, that word has the stress on the middle syllable. You don't say consider, right? you don't stress the con, you don't stress the er, you stress the sid, consider. You have to place that word in such a line so that it aligns with an iambic pentameter pattern. So you can see, because the word has three syllables, the first two, which are an iam, are placed in the second foot, and the third one just becomes the first syllable of the third foot. And then how, of course, is stressed because how is kind of a louder word that we say. Not every poem is, of course, written with perfect meter. There are many modern poems that don't have any meter at all, that don't have any kind of rhythm at all. Uh, but uh, a lot of the older poems do follow a rhythm. However, not all of them follow a perfect rigid rhythm. You can see that uh, in some poetry, uh, you can vary the number of feet. So here's uh, intimations of immortality. You've got an iambic pentameter line, an iambic tetrameter line, an iambic dimeter line. So the whole poem is written uh, in iambic feet, but each line differs in the number of feet that it has. Now let's take a look at a different type of rhythm here. So from the first page, uh, we have anapestic tetrameter. So Tetrameter, already you know it's four feet. Anapestic means that each foot has three actual syllables. So in this case, the poem goes like this. The Assyrian came down like the wolf on the fold, and his cohorts were gleaming in purple and gold, and the sheen of their spears was like stars on the sea. And you can see this rhythm. It's like ch-ch-ch-ch-ch-ch-ch-ch-ch-ch. It's uh, just going along going along. Now, a lot of you might think, well, what use is this today? It doesn't uh, make any sense to me that we have to be studying this. Uh, no one writes like this, and I would beg to differ. Take a look at a popular song like Eminem's uh, The Way I Am, for example. So the song starts out going, I sit back with this pack of zigzags and this bag, and I'm not going to say any more because there's a lot of swearing in the song, but you can see it is the exact same rhythm as the Assyrian came down like the wolf in the fold. So you can see that modern rappers still use this technique in order to uh, establish rhythm in their songs. Eminem is uh, definitely one of the uh, primary guys doing this. I don't know if Eminem sits down and goes, well, I'm going to write this song in anapestic tetrameter. Uh, but that's the way it came out, and maybe he just hears it in his head, and he sees the rhythm, and that's how the song comes out. And that's, that's how you know a talented writer versus a less talented poet. So you can, I'm sure you've heard someone write a poem that rhymes, and uh, the last word in each line rhymes with another word in another line, and yet the poem still sounds terrible, and the reason it sounds terrible is because the rhythm inside the verse is not there. A good writer can establish a rhythm inside the verse, whereas a poor writer will just rhyme the last word, and that's all they'll do. Uh, and the last one we're going to look at is trochaic tetrameter from The Tiger by William Blake. It's a very famous poem. The whole poem isn't tetrameter because there's kind of like a one syllable dangling at the end, but the poem starts out, tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night, and uh, you know, continues, what immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? And you can see this uh, rhythm being established. You can see the rhythm kind of going along. And the whole idea is that uh, Blake is talking here about God 
making a tiger. The image he wants to portray is a blacksmith basically hammering a tiger into shape in his forge. And so he writes the poem in tro trochaic tetrameter because he wants to mimic the hammering of a blacksmith. Tiger, tiger, burning, bright. And you can see that uh, the, the poem establishes that kind of aggressive rhythm. Whereas if you write in, say, uh, iambic pentameter, it comes out very sing-song. When I consider how my life is spent, ere half my days in this dark world and wide, that's, that's kind of very nice and easy going, whereas Tiger Tiger is uh, quite aggressive sounding. So this is an example of poets using the structure of language to get their message across, uh, as well as the words and the content of what they're writing. So take another look at these metric feet. Uh, I've also included several poems. I've included two Shakespeare sonnets here. Uh, and I also included the tiger in the last handout. Uh, so if uh, I'm not going to go through them all, I'll go through the first one. And when I read the whole poem, you'll be able to hear the entire rhythm here. So, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed. And every fair from fair sometime declines by chance, or nature's changing course untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou owest. Nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. Now, you can hear the rhythm. You might not be able to even tell what the poem is about, but you can hear just the beautiful rhythm of the lines. Each line is exactly 10 syllables long. Each line is, is written in iambic pentameter. You can see the rhyme scheme A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, and he ends off with a couplet at the end, G, G. Okay, the last two lines rhyme. Uh, and that gives the poem uh, some punctuation at the end. This is, this is the end of the poem. I've rhymed the last two lines, whereas before I was rhyming uh, every other line. These last two, I'm going to rhyme together. It's a 14-line poem. Very, very structured. Now, what, what's the poem about? I'm quickly going to go over it. Shakespeare uh, is kind of obsessed with aging here, and he, this is a theme that runs through most of his sonnets. Uh, so he's comparing, he's writing to a woman here, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. You're nicer than a summer's day. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath uh, all too short a date. So sometimes the summer may have rough winds, and sometimes it's too short. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines. The eye of heaven, of course, being the sun. So sometimes it's too hot. And often is his gold complexion dimmed, so sometimes it's cloudy, so it's not nice. And every fair from fair sometime declines, by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. That means that everything that is fair declines in fairness and eventually fades away. The beauty fades away. And then he has a turn. He includes a but. So everything ages, everything gets older, everything loses its beauty, but... Thy eternal summer shall not fade, your summer will never fade, nor lose possession of the fair thou owest, you're always going to be fair. Nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. So death is, he's personifying death here, this personification. Death will not brag that you wander in his shade, you'll never die, when in eternal lines of time you grow, basically as time passes. And he ends off with the punchline, so long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. And by this, he of course means the poem. So basically what he's saying here is that I've immortalized your beauty in this poem, and because I've written it down and uh, people will be able to read and see this poem for centuries into the future. Your beauty is going to live on forever. You're never going to fade, uh, and you're never going to get old. So it's, uh, it's a nice sentiment. She's probably dead, though, so it doesn't matter much to her, but it must have been pretty romantic at the time. Uh, now, you guys can read the second one here uh, on your own. 
this video is getting a little too long and of course you can read the tiger as well the tiger is uh, a uh, critically acclaimed and very popular poem uh, it's one of the greatest poems in english poetry but what i want you to do uh, for today with all this information now that you've read it and uh, you've understood it, you might want to reread the uh, handout that i gave to you but basically what i want you to do is to write a structured poem it doesn't have to be a sonnet uh, it's not easy to write a sonnet uh, the sonnet is very structured i mean you can see in this poem not only is every line the exact same number of syllables and the rhyme scheme is perfect and the rhythm is perfect you know you can see like and summer's lease had all too short a date everything is perfect it's very hard to do that but i would like you to write uh, a poem of at least eight lines with a regular meter uh, what do i mean by regular meter maybe eight syllables in the poem and they all might be iambic or they all might be trochaic or maybe three feet per line and they all might be anapestic whichever one you choose I want you to develop a poem with some rhythm. I want you to start thinking about the rhythm in your language and how it sounds and how some people sound very awkward and some people sound uh, very articulate. The great speakers of our time, someone like say Barack Obama, uh, sounds very articulate. People are mesmerized by what he says because the rhythm of the language is there and uh, those people have an innate understanding of that rhythm. Songwriters, rappers, uh, great speakers, they all have this innate understanding. And if you can kind of develop that understanding, it's going to help you become a better writer, a better speaker, and oops, and it will definitely uh, benefit you down the line. So I'm going to leave you guys with that. This is going to be your third journal, uh, a poem. This doesn't have to be too long. If you want to make it longer, you can, but at least eight lines with a regular meter and a regular rhyme. Again, most poetry doesn't have a meter and doesn't rhyme these days, but I want you guys to practice this uh, just kind of for uh, practicing a different type of poetry. So by now you've got an epic poem, you've got a lyric poem, and now this third structured poem is going to be your third journal. So make sure you're staying caught up with your journals. Make sure you're staying caught up with uh, your work in English class. As I said, I'm not giving you too much, but do stay caught up with it and do take a little bit of time just to sit down and write it out. Okay, so that's it for today. Uh, we're gonna sign off. Here's my cat, Letty, who's uh, been keeping me some company here. Uh, have fun writing your poetry, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye. Bigowski's English class.